Okay, here's that time. Uh, top 10 worst movies of 2018. Of course, here are a couple of honorable mentions. These are films I'm okay with. They aren't objectively great, but they're fine. Let's dig into number 10, Super Troopers 2. I know I kind of said like, if you were a fan of the first Super Troopers movie, you will probably enjoy this movie just fine. Some of the stuff worked for me, but ultimately as I spent more time away from the film and when I actually kind of revisited it recently, I was kind of like, eh, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent to this movie now. That's why it's number 10. It's low on the list because it just left me feeling kind of nothing. It doesn't need to be a Super Troopers franchise. I'm glad you guys had fun making it. Number nine, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. This is kind of a franchise I'm like, kind of done with the Jurassic franchise, but it's placed a little bit above Super Troopers 2 because I'm just kind of disappointed with what Jurassic Park and its subsequent sequels have become. Unless the next movie goes full Dino Riders and just goes for the sheer stupidity of it, I won't be interested in seeing it in theaters, so. Fallen Kingdom, Fallen Franchise. Number eight, Extinction. I wised up this year and decided, hey, I don't wanna have to pay full admission price for crap. So Extinction, I saw on Netflix, has an interesting premise. There, There's a reveal in the plot, uh, what looks to be just a typical alien, alien invasion narrative, takes a sudden turn, and I'm okay with that turn, if only the production, performances, and script actually supported it well enough. Michael Pena doesn't look invested at all at being the lead of this story, possibly because James McAvoy was supposed to be the lead of this story, but he opted out and they replaced him with Michael Pena, so I'm sure that was a good feeling for Michael Pena. Production-wise, I don't know, it just feels really small scale. It, I don't know, you just get this vibe off of Netflix movies, especially these Netflix science fiction movies where you're kind of like, yeah, I can see why this is made, why this is being released on Netflix. It, it just, despite such an interesting premise, the scope and production of it feels so minuscule. The script, this premise could have worked perhaps with a little bit more tweaking, perhaps with a little bit slicker storytelling or characters I could actually care about. So, sorry Extinction, you're an extinker. Nah, that's about the level of writing you'd expect from this script. Number seven, Beast of Burden. This was an Amazon movie, at least a movie I saw on Amazon. And again, interesting premise, uh, very Hitchcockian in its um, idea. Uh, I could see the potential for some genuine suspense, some genuine uh, thrilling moments as Daniel Radcliffe plays this drug mule who's flying product over the border in his rinky-dink little plane in terrible weather. That could create some very tense moments. Two things though. One, uh, I get that you want to go for as natural lighting as possible, but when you're dealing with flying a plane at night in the midst of cloudy weather, maybe throw a little bit more lighting on there. I understand, you know, naturally we wouldn't see much, but that's why it's a movie. You can toy with that a little bit. The whole last act of this movie is shot entirely in the dark with seemingly only natural lighting to show you what's going on. So that just means you see silhouettes and headlights every once in a while. So that kind of killed the thrill for me. Two, uh, while I said the premise is interesting for suspense, the contrivances they write in to stress Daniel Radcliffe out on his flight seem really forced. Of course, a DEA agent trying to flip him of course he's gonna harass him in the middle of his flight and threaten him with jail time when he's trying to maintain his cover and cool. Of course the cartel's enforcer is going to call him up in the middle of his flight while he's carrying your precious product across the border and stress him out by saying that he kidnapped his wife and is threatening to kill her. Yeah, you know, the typical things you wanna do if you want your pilot to just freak the fuck out and crash. Those moments felt very forced and it's something that I believe if Hitchcock had handled this type of idea, he would have set all that up way before we're actually into the narrative with it. Like, again, his whole famous um, quote about, you know, the bomb. You show the bomb once, you establish that the bomb is there in this room, and then you leave it alone for a while and let the characters and the narrative do its thing. You don't have to constantly be coming back to the bomb. I feel that this movie could have handled its bomb a little bit better. So yeah, Beast of Burden, 
Again, potential there, but squandered. Uh, number six, the Cloverfield Paradox. This clearly set the standard that uh, Cloverfield was just a brand name they're gonna tag on to some loose ideas and uh, see what comes of it. I mean, it's pretty telling that Overlord dropped its Cloverfield association before it was released in theaters, probably because this didn't do so great critically. Cloverfield Paradox, this of course, was the movie that was released on game day uh, for free on Netflix, so there's its plus, but again, it's just a mishmash of ideas. Some of them fascinating, some of them seem really kind of forced, and especially forced is the Cloverfield tie-in. They want to make you think that it's all connected, but it's not, and ultimately, that connection is squandered and lost, and Cloverfield Paradox in and of itself is very paradoxical in that it wants to be all these things, but doesn't succeed in being one idea. Number five, Mute. Talk about it. It's kind of a silly movie. Duncan Jones, I finished Moon. I like Moon. I am kind of sad that he kind of carried on the story of Moon in the background of this movie. Eh, I don't know. Mute, uh, it didn't play it into its gimmick too much, which is your main hero is mute. Things were still easily resolved. Only every once in a while does the idea that he is mute play into it. Not even crazy ass Paul Rudd could save this film. Number four, Dark Crimes. This technically isn't a 2018 movie. This is a movie that was shelved for a couple years and released in 2018 on Amazon again. And I can tell why it's shelved. And the only glimmer of hope I can give this movie is that, God damn it, Jim Carrey tries. He wanted this very much to be his dark turn. And his performance is actually pretty good. He is, he's playing it down. He's not hamming it up too much. He's not over playing the dramatic or the tense stuff. He is trying to play this straightforward, gritty, pulpy detective in this crime thriller. But the plot is a jumbled mess. Characters and plot elements I feel were dropped in editing, but you're still supposed to invest in when his mom dies at the end, even though we only met her for like 30 seconds in the beginning. Charlotte Gainsborough from, uh, I know from Nymphomaniac, you see the twist with her coming a mile away. And while well, she tries to make the most of her character here, again, the editing doesn't help this because we're supposed to like her, then we're supposed to be repulsed by her, then she's a woman of mystery. It's a very schizophrenically edited type of film, I feel. While trying to maintain a consistency of dreariness, they go from this wild, crazy BDSM type uh, narrative to grounded, hardened, gritty thriller with police corruption. And it just never really knows what it wants to be about. So, dark crimes has to do its dark time. Number three, The Titan. Sam Worthington plays a moonfish man. Number two, The Predator. This was a huge disappointment, and it wouldn't have been if it had been clear that Shane Black wanted to make a parody of the Predator franchise. I don't think that's what he wanted to do. It's really weird because I usually like Shane Black movies. Like, The Other Guys was on my list last year, I believe. Or was that the year before? Whenever The Other Guys came out. Oh no, not The Other Guys. That's a Will Ferrell Mark Wahlberg movie, isn't it? The Nice Guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus. Anyways, no, I genuinely do like Shane, Shane Black. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang, one of my favorite films. But here, the meathead mentality is an overdrive. And I can't tell if it's intentional or not, and that is a detriment to the movie. I wouldn't mind, you know, following this ragtag group of military, you know, PTSD survivors, whatever, around as they try to figure out what the Predator's doing here on Earth. But, God, they're annoying. <laughs> Tonal shifts. Again, all over the place. It tries to go for this dark, kind of visceral punch that the original Predator had, and then it becomes straight up cartoon fodder uh, from time to time with a cutesy cutesy Predator dog. This movie deserved better. Shane Black deserved better, even though he's the one who probably steered this movie off course. I, I just wasn't enjoying the Predator at all, because I do like Predator. I like Predator 2. I even like Alien versus Predator. God help me. And Predators, I thought was a decent enough like spiritual successor and sequel to the franchise. I actually kind of dug that aesthetic of being trapped on their home world. I'd say better luck next time with this, but hopefully they just let the franchise rest. Let all these 80s action franchises rest, please. They were great for the 80s, and it's great to revisit them when you want to feel nostalgic about the 80s. And finally, number one, least favorite or worst movie of the year. The Happy Time Murders. Yep, I wish I could say I saw this on Amazon or Netflix for free, but no, I had to buy it on iTunes. 
because I was curious. Man, this is the most unfunny puppet movie I've ever seen. It's just, I, I don't even feel like it's like controversial or mean-spirited, it's just lame. The jokes are very, very basic sophomoric humor. The shock value of it, you saw in the Restricted Band trailer, that's pretty much it. My brain has stopped working now because I'm remembering the Happy Time murders. The only thing I can say that's a positive to the Happy Time murders is at least, at least good old Stanley from The Office found some work after The Office. I kind of missed Leslie Baker. So, I'm glad he's still getting work. Oh, okay, I'll give him a... Uh, the puppetry looks good, at least. I mean, it's Brian Hansen. He's obviously been involved in this work for a long time. The name's kind of a giveaway as to his expertise in puppetry. It's just too bad it's in service of this. I thought it was gonna be really uproarious and kind of, you know, wacky kind of personality, ranting and raving about the worst movies of 2018, but now I'm just bummed out. So I'm gonna do what was suggested in the Won't You Be My Neighbor documentary. I'm gonna be thinking about people, places, things, and movies that inspire me or have significant meaning for me. And that'll help lift my spirits well into 2019. I encourage you to do the same. Forget all about the Happy Time Murders. Happy New Year.